So to those of you who are just joining us, welcome. This indeed is a special conversation with journalist and presenter Barbara Serra about her documentary, Fascism in the Family, and the thoughts that it stimulates about the questions of the far right movement, not only in Italy, but also in areas beyond Italy, our own country and around the world. We'll be starting in hmm, about 30, 45 seconds, just as people come in here. But let me just thank you all, especially Barbara, but Daniele Albertazzi, who will be here as well alongside me, and all of you for joining us for this very special event. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, okay, everybody, thank you again. Such an honor to be here as part of the uh, ESRC Festival here at the University of Birmingham. Uh, it's a very special occasion for me because the title talks a little bit about what we're talking about, which is uh, the questions about fascism, fascism in Italy, the far right beyond Italy, but it's special for me because of how this all came about. Uh, there will be a link which we'll share on the right-hand side in case you haven't seen it, which is a documentary which aired on Al Jazeera earlier this year. And this documentary is the combination of a very important political story, but it's a very important personal story. It is the story of uh, Barbara Sarah and her family. Now I knew of Barbara because I've been a long time admirer of the work. Uh, she started in media with the BBC uh, and then with Sky and Channel 5. And then she was one of the launch presenters with Al Jazeera English, which has been a huge influence on me as I moved into journalism myself after being an academic. And as that journey has taken place, I've watched with admiration the way that she has covered international affairs with the ability not only to narrate it effectively to an audience, but always with a sense of the deeper meaning of what is occurring in our societies and between our societies. Uh, Barbara was born in Italy, but her own story is distinctive. Uh, she was uh, raised in Denmark and then came to the United Kingdom was at LSE, uh, nice because I also was there. So it gives me a bit of a link. And that was at City University. So that experience of growing up gives a background to the story. Well, you know what? As we talk about this documentary, Fascism in the Family, let me start with Barbara by welcoming you here and by welcoming Daniele Albertazzi, who will be alongside me uh, reader in politics at the University of Birmingham's Political and International Studies Department, author of Populism of Power. Barbara, this is a personal journey. What motivated you to delve into the story of your grandfather, who had such an influence on your own journey and on the outcome of this documentary? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Scott, um, and thank you, everyone who's joined uh, to, you know, to talk in this uh, discussion. Scott, I remember when we first spoke about this documentary, you were actually in the newsroom, I think it was this time last year, before the world changed and when people could still sort of come into the newsroom. And I remember talking to you before the film was uh, even edited. So it's really special for me to be here uh, right now. And it's been interesting how the film went out uh, at the end of January to coincide with... Uh, the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And it's just been interest, interesting, of course, how the world has changed since then again. So your question, what made me decide to do a, a film like Fascism in the Family? So first of all, Al Jazeera had this strand called Al Jazeera Correspondent. And because we're a pretty varied workforce, um, everyone brings their stories and it's meant to be a, a personal story, but something that resonates. And so people have done it about yoga, people have done it about female genital mutilation from all over the world, different angles. And then I thought, well, I've always known that my um, grandfather had been a fascist in um, you know, Mussolini's Italy in Sardinia. But of course, what started to happen in the years leading up to the production of the documentary is that the word fascism just kept on cropping up the whole time. So even after the Brexit debate, you know, there's always people attacking, you know, this is fascism, this isn't. Then, of course, Donald Trump comes to power. We all know that there's various accusations. Uh, now, I, I feel the word is overused, but we do know that the word fascism crops up the whole time. You go on Twitter now. Uh, you put fascism in the search uh, box and it's all about the US rather than Italy. But I thought, well, you know, the thing is that actually fascism 
was born in Italy. At the very least, Mussolini is the man that coined the word. And so I thought of putting together the story of my grandfather using Italy as an example, because I thought if you, you know, it's a big subject. So I thought let's keep it at least national rather than the whole world. So I'm um, kind of looking at the past, really answering what fascism was, and then analyzing what is happening today, again, in Italy, and seeing if there were parallels, if there were echoes, and what those were. And I have to say, you know, the word fascism kind of almost means two different things, depending on the language that you use. If I'm speaking in Italian, all my, you know, anyone who's listening to me, who also by definition speaks Italian, will very much anchor that word in the two decades, more or less, of, fasc of Mussolini's rule in Italy. I think certainly in my sort of work in international journalism and also just following the debates here in the UK or in the US, the word fascism in English has become a bit of a catch-all for certainly Nazism, but just in general authoritarian regimes. So the point that if you go on YouTube and fascism, it says, you know, brings up a swastika. So very much linked with that. So I decided to look at the history of my grandfather. Now, for those who haven't seen the film, it's called Fascism in the Family on the Al Jazeera uh, website or YouTube, um, because my grandfather was a fascist mayor. Um, we have kids really late in my family. So he was actually born in 1895, fought in World War I. And so he joined fascism straight after World War I, like many people, um, uh, like many people, uh, you know, the ones who did, uh, did. And he was fascist mayor of a very key place uh, in Italy, in Sardinia. Now, Sardinia was kind of, we'll discuss later, I'm sure, a bit cut out of some of the worst atrocities of fascism and then Nazi fascism. But it was crucial because he was mayor of a town called Carbonia, which was very much a key project of Mussolini's. Carbonia means, you know, carbon, coal. Uh, so it was a mining town. And this was in the late 30s. So already when Italy is allied with Germany um, and the Carbonia and the mine was going to be key uh, in the war effort, which at this point, you know, I mean, at least for the Mussolini government, it was obvious that that's where things were heading. So I did a lot of research on that side um, and then tried to link. So I'd say the documentary is kind of a third, the historical stroke personal side, and then always linking it to what is happening in Italy now. I interview some amazing people. The most amazing of all is Liliana Segre, who is a senator for life in Italy, and she is also a Holocaust survivor. So she was 13 when she was deported to Auschwitz with her dad, her dad died and she came back. And she's very much in the years uh, since, especially since the nineties, she's kind of become almost Italy's conscience in many ways. And she's a Senator for life and has been speaking out. So um, going through, you know, all history really is, is personal and I focus on my personal story, but you know, it's a story that in one way or another is echoed by very many Italians. One thing, I'll stop talking now, but one of the things that's really, a lot surprised me. And I always like to remind people, you know, I left Italy when I was eight. So it kind of worked both ways. In one way, for the international audience, it's the story of an Italian. But for many viewers in Italy, it was almost the story of a foreigner or someone that didn't grow up with, you know, I always knew my grandfather was a fascist, but I didn't grow up there. So it's not like when I went to school, people were like, oh, you know, her grandfather was a fascist, her grandfather was an anti-fascist. You know, it wasn't part of my, of my life. And it always makes me, smile a little when English people or American people always show such surprise. They're like, your grandfather was a fascist. I feel like going, you know, it's a lot more common than you would think without minimizing what it means. And I think if you watch the movie, I like to think it's obvious that I didn't hold back. But I think the first thing to remember is that, you know, I mean, fascism took hold in Italy for 20 years. Yes, of course, there were anti-fascists. Of course, uh, there were people, especially with the alliance uh, with Nazism that fought against it but it was also something that a lot of people stuck by and, and believed in, including my grandfather. That's, yeah, and that's the start of the journey. And again, folks, if you're out there and you haven't seen the film, we've got the link up in the chat box. And also let me remind you that if you have questions and answers that already are starting to come to mind, please put them in the Q&A box. And we want this to be a very free flowing discussion. Uh, Barbara, I guess I'd like to follow up with one other thing that struck me as I watched the film, which is the, the opening of it. So sort of to link up the personal and the political, you know, the film's got this dramatic opening where you're at a rally of Matteo Salvini, uh, the Italian leader, leader of the League Party. Uh, and it's this dramatic moment of this energy 
that this rally has generated. And you're picking up on that and talking about these people adore him. But then you mentioned that some people don't. And that's when you bring up this notion of, and you're careful to express it, the notion of the far right. Fascism is anchored in the 20s and the 30s. But as you're experiencing this in the Italy of today, what, what can Italy learn from that period? Or how is Italy navigating this, that period in the terms of far right politics? And I guess more importantly, what can the world learn from that navigation? Yeah, so listen, that's a big question. Um, uh, what can Italy learn? I think interesting. Italy is an interesting example because some of the divisions and the splits um, that came from the from the fascist era, in a way, still uh, are still alive today. So when I meet Mr. Far Right supporter or extreme right supporter Mussolini's uh, um, tomb, first thing he tells me is, "My father was from the right. My grandfather was from the right." And whenever I speak to people, you know, they'll always say, "Oh, you know, I, I vote left because my grandparents are anti-fascist." So I think there's something specific about Italy in the way that those divisions have kind of been crystallized. So, I mean, Matteo Salvini uh, was interesting. I picked him. Again, um, I, I've gone on TV in Italy saying, I don't think Matteo Salvini is a fascist, but I think there's certainly a, a part of the Italian population that feels a kind of nostalgia to the fascist decades. And I think you could argue definitely, and I do in the film, that there's some little, you know, kind of a little bit of dog whistling, you could say that, mm. to, to try to appeal um, to that part. I think the thing that underlines a lot of the far right, if we want to use that word, groups, um, is the anti-immigration stance. So, and we see that right across the board. Um, so what can Italy uh, learn? I think just to be really um, clear about what happened and again, what I said that sometimes you, um, I mean, it's interesting, my grandfather joined, I don't, almost don't want to give the film away, but my grandfather joined fascism right after World War I, young man, he, he'd fought in the war, he, he was a pilot, he got shot down and got captured, you know, and I think my message from the film would be, look, you can join something when you're young, full of, full of ideology, um, and then it can mutate on you. I think when things started getting you know, when the real, when I'm assuming my grandfather really started asking questions, you know, that's 20 years down the line. And so my thing would be, look, things happen slowly. So be careful whenever you make that pact with the devil of giving all, you know, of, of, of giving power to something that's not democratic and, and is, is more like a, a dictator like Mussolini eventually ended up being. I think those would be the lessons. I mean, I think with Daniele, we can get more into the details of, you know, for example, uh, you know, the word fascism itself starts from the militias that effectively helped Mussolini. I mean, there would be some echoes of, of, of that now. But, you know, I mean, Mussolini was having political opponents murdered, so we're not at that stage in, in any place uh, yet. But I, I think the lesson mainly to learn is to try to um, face up to one's past, um, and it always has to be done on a personal level. I mean, you know, my grandfather was a fascist. A lot of other people's grandfathers weren't, but it's the history of Italy. And I think that's the same lesson that you could say applies to the UK when it comes to the empire or the US when it comes to slavery. And we're now seeing Black Lives Matter, obviously a lot of things not solved. I, I just think, I always hate it when people say, oh, you were so brave to do all this. I never see it as that. I just think, look, you know, the sins of the past are not our sins. The only sins that we could make is to not, not try to a, understand what happened and also understand the motivations. It's too easy to think I would never act that way, you know, when it comes to a lot of things. So, so that's, I think with Daniele, we can get into more the nitty gritty of some of the echoes of the fascism. Um, but, but yeah, but I think the Italian example is a bit more detailed because it left such a mark on the population. Oh, I've lost you. The, the host can't, <laughs> the host never remembers to unmute his microphone. That's great practice. Anyway, I'm back and let me bring in, let me bring in an expert and, uh, you know, in, in Italy and far right, well, and politics and populism. Uh, Daniele, how do we start to navigate this with Barb? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, uh, Scott, for sharing this. Uh, and, and many thanks to Barbara for being with us. Uh, she's a very busy person. So this is great that we can do this. Um, I suggest, uh, if uh, if it's possible, to, to to reflect a little bit more on the personal, and then maybe uh, we can talk uh, a lot more about uh, more general themes. And I'm sure that there will be questions coming in from 
uh, the audience as well. Uh, but uh, I found some, something that was really interesting about this documentary is this idea that, you know, it talks about the past of all Italians, uh, but in reality it talks about the past of all Europeans. Uh, and um, unlike uh, uh, the example of Sardinia, I mean, I was born in Bologna, so my daughters here in the UK go to school and, and they are taken to remember uh, Second World War, that there is a lot of talk to, uh, about it in school. And the same was for me when during primary school we would have people coming in to talk to us about the resistance because obviously the area I was born in was a red area where uh, there were plenty of fights between fascists and partisans after 1943. So there as well, there will be a lot of talk about uh, who was in the resistance or who had been uh, in the fascist party. And the, the thing is that it's something that uh, um, an international audience doesn't always appreciate or recognize, that the fascist party had millions of members uh, when it became a regime. So after Mussolini uh, actually uh, managed to, 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 to take control uh, in Italy. And, uh, you could not teach a university without being a member of, uh, of the fascist party. There were plenty of professions that you just could not be uh, doing anymore if you didn't join the fascist party. So, you know, in terms of how many people have joined and how many people were part of it, you are really talking about millions of people. It's, it's ingrained in this recent history. And it's also the case, I'm afraid, that there were millions of people who uh, also joined not out of just necessity, which was the case for many of them, but also out of, of conviction. So you cannot really control a whole country just by means of repression. Uh, you can just go some way towards doing it. Uh, but of course, something that the fascist party uh, was doing very well and by the way, they had learned that from Antonio Gramsci, so uh, from one of the founders of the Communist Party, was the idea that you have to win the revolution in the cultural realm, not just uh, in terms of the repression or, or the kind of um, police forces, but you have to win the revolution at level of culture and identity. And that is something they were doing very efficiently uh, in terms of uh, uh, indoctrinating people at school, in terms of controlling what was then the most powerful medium, which was the radio, uh, controlling newspapers and so on and so forth. So we are talking about, uh, you know, a, a kind of whole way of life, if you want. And I think it's, it's really interesting in the case of this documentary that uh, it's at the same time, it's a documentary that picks up on a lot of themes that are relevant to us today but also talks about uh, so going back and, and kind of finding something about your own family, which as I said, is also something about Italy as a whole, Europe as a whole. So I wanted to kind of ask Barbara also whether she thinks that, you know, should, a documentary also makes some kind of more general statement about memory, the role of remembering, the importance of remembering. Y yeah, no, I, I mean, absolutely. And from a, personal point of view, I, re I mean, I always knew that my grandfather had a role in fascism, no one ever, um, never, no one ever hid it in the family. Also, you know, in that part of Italy, I mean, literally, we drive past Carbonia on the way to a summer house, so it's like, it's there. Um, I suppose I see it as a lesson that I'm being taught from beyond the grave. My grandfather died when I was two months old, so I never met him. Um, and it's interesting, I mean, the feedback to this film has been amazing. It, as in, it's so interesting. And, and at Al Jazeera, you get it from all over the world. So you can imagine a lot of people from India are writing in with their thoughts about fascism right now or African countries. So even places in the world where obviously they know about World War II, but not in the same way that Westerners uh, would. And, and for example, there, there was one message that kind of hit me and it was like, do you forgive your grandfather? And, and I kind of think, you know, I didn't even see it in that framing because first of all, it's not for me to do that. Uh, the people that had to forgive him presumably did or didn't back in the day. Um, but also I just see it as a lesson that to me, it's like, okay, what can I learn from his experience? And you have to be really brutally honest with yourself, I think, when you do that. Because I think there is, um, going back to that, how Italians see it and how English people, or, you know, or people, by English people, I mean the people that 
didn't in their nation, their recent national history, live the extremism of fascism or Nazism or being basically on the wrong side of history in World War II. So that's what I mean uh, by that. And, and it's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, I never once in the middle of this documentary think I would never have done that. I would never have done that. I would have been the person that stood up and said, absolutely not, and all of that. Because, you know, I work at Al Jazeera and I have worked at Al Jazeera for 15 years and I've got a pretty strong stomach for all the awful things that happen in the world. And there's a lot of dynamics at play the whole time. And I think that's the lesson, you know, and I think we get called to make the big decisions that our grandchildren will remember a hundred years down the line. They're not gonna be the obvious ones. And Daniela, I remember one of the things that you said, um, we had a little chat before this, obviously. Like one thing that I think is absolutely lost in the English speaking debate is that fascism was not conservative. Fascism was progressive. And there you have my grandfather coming back from World War I. So you have a whole generation of young, young men, the ones that did join fascism, not everybody did, but that was the core support at the beginning, you know, that want to create a new Italy. And, and my grandfather, from everything I've read and, and seen, you know, insofar as I can know, actually absolutely believed in the project. Now he joined when it wasn't yet a dictatorship, you know, the racial laws are passed 20 years down the line. You know, anti-Semitism, for example, was not a key part of the beginning of fascism at all. But he believed in the project because it was all about change. It was all about creating a new Italy, a new country that was going to be proud in the world, that was going to, and my grandfather had huge links to Sardinia. So to him, Carbonia being built in Sardinia was great, you know, helping the country. So I always think that that's a really interesting dynamic, you know, that fascism was a progressive force of change. And then you get on that bandwagon and next thing you know, you're basically not quite complicit in the Holocaust, but certainly, you know, guilty by association because that's where fascism ultimately led with the alliance in, in Germany. So I, I think that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of one of the things that I take with me after, you know, after the whole film uh, was, was done. And, and I mean, there's a lot of details. So again, I'll say, watch the film. <laughs> but Barbara, thank you. We've gotten a question from uh, James, and forgive me, James, if I mispronounce this, Pepiot, um, and I, and I, who brings in this line of thought that's come out that, fasc that fascism has something to do with narcissism, right? This is a narcissist ideology, or from other folks that, you know, it's linked to pathology and abuse. People become fascist out of that sense of being abused. But you seem to be telling a different narrative there from your grandfather's story and from those you encountered. Look, you know, I mean, I'll raise my hands up. I'm, I'm not an academic, I'm no. not a historian. And I specifically anchored this program into his story and a little bit more widely Italy, because the last thing I'll do is pretend to be an expert on fascism when people have dedicated the past however many years studying the subject. Um, I'll say that's not what I found. Um, and and it, um, you know, again, if you look at how fascism started, I mean, violence was always at the key of it. So I don't think I would say narcissism. I would say, and again, I don't know if Daniele agrees with me, violence was always at the core. And why? Because you have a generation of young men just out of World War I, they hate the establishment because the establishment sent them to die. And then apparently, you know, Italy was among the victors of World War I, but kind of got done over in their eyes for some of the things that they were meant to get from the other allies. So you have a generation that's angry at the establishment, used to violence and killing and death, used to bearing arms and using them and wanting change. So I would say that violence and the desire for change would have been, if we're looking at the core, fascism, Italy, when it started, from what I have done, from what I have sort of read and seen, I would say that those were the two key elements. Daniela? Yeah, so obviously there is a huge literature on uh, on reading fascism through uh, psychoanalytical even lenses. Um, I, I point out some of the kind of historical background that I think uh, is really important to keep in mind. And not everybody, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, is is uh, fully aware of this. Uh, in my view, and that's why I wouldn't use the term fascism very liberally. I would actually restrict it to very specific uh, movements myself. Uh, in my view, you cannot understand what happened with the rise in power of Mussolini if you don't take into consideration very carefully what Barbara just mentioned. It's very important how the First World War ended in Italy. 
so Italy was on the winning side, but uh, a lot of people who fought in the war uh, felt that this was a mutilated victory. This was the expression uh, back at the time, the mutilated victory, because so basically, it's a long story, but basically because Italy did not, man did not manage to gain all the territories that had been promised to Italy if it had entered the conflict. And particularly, we are thinking about uh, some uh, of what then ended up being part of Yugoslavia. Uh, for instance, Fiume, uh, so uh, the coast in Croatia and parts of, of um, uh what is now uh, what, what became Yugoslavia that were inhabited by Italians because of the history of the Venetian uh, Empire and and the history of Venice. Uh, so uh, there was a, a lot of talk about this mutilated victory. Uh, there was, uh, of course, uh, a great action on the part of socialists and communists in the period that leads to Mussolini being allowed to gain power. Because let's remember that he's allowed to gain power by not just the king, but also by much more moderate forces in Italy. Otherwise, he would never have become prime minister. And it is a process that goes on through time from prime minister to dictator. It doesn't happen overnight. So there was a lot of kind of unrest. And, and initially, the, this is what is interesting. Of course, uh, fascism is both revolutionary and reactionary. I mean, uh, harshly reactionary, but also revolutionary because it takes a lot of ideas and proposals from uh, socialists, including the little known thing of, of allowing women to vote. Uh, so I'm talking here, I'm talking at the origins of fascism. So uh, th there is this kind of, at the same time, inspired by, by some socialist ideas, but also uh, used by uh, ruling classes, middle classes, the king, to try and keep a lid on, on socialist unrest. So all of this provides a kind of uh, important uh, kind of background that I think we need to keep in mind to understand why fascism is at the same time reactionary and revolutionary. And maybe we can go back to this discussion later if you want. And that's one reason why, uh, you know, I would try to use the term fascism uh, and apply only to certain contexts. And I see that some of the comments, uh, as people say that there are parallels with Germany. Of course there are, but let's keep in mind that uh, of course uh, in Germany happens years later and in part the model is indeed Italy. I mean, that's interesting. That's what I really found uh, in my research. And, uh, you know, basically I'll just explain it briefly. One of the reasons, so there's two reasons I decided to make the film. One, because the term fascism was everywhere. And then also because a couple of years ago, literally everyone in my family kind of died through natural causes. And um, basically we just started, we had to sell various houses and start going through all the paperwork. And my sister and I found a letter from Nazi Germany addressed to my grandfather. Now, because I know my history, I knew that Italy, especially, I mean, I say I know my history, I don't mean to offend anyone, but what I have discovered is that apart from Italians, no one really has an understanding of what Italy went through with fascism. So I'll just give you the tiny synopsis. In 1943, because the war is going terribly, it's the Council of Fascism that basically unseats Berlusconi and jails him. At that point, the Allies are coming up from the south. Daniele, please bear with me. I, I think you, you like meant to say Mussolini. I think you meant to say unseats Mussolini. I like. Oh, who did I say? Uh, you said Berlusconi, which Oh my goodness, I'm glad it just happened here, not when I was on air. <laughs> I definitely did, yeah, he wasn't around. He's not young, but he wasn't around in 1943. So, um, so they unseat Mussolini. The Allies are coming up from the south. The Germans effectively invade from the north because Hitler realizes that's going to be the front. So Italy is effectively split in two. So the south, including my grandfather at this point, is under the Allies, so the Americans and the Brits, to the point that actually the Americans put my grandfather in charge of the mine. But the north of Italy is Nazi occupied. And what's, what I find really interesting is that the Italians actually use a different phrase for this. They call it Nazi fascism. So fascism is until 1943 and that often the phrase used for what happened in the north uh, after 43 is Nazi fascism. And the over, you know, the deportations to Germany of the Jews, including, um, Liliana Segre, the senator that I spoke to in the film, happened at that point. So, to cut a long story short, I always knew that my grandfather being in Sardinia was, you know, would have been cut out of all of that. And even though, of course, authoritarian regimes are terrible, and of course, terrible things happen under fascism itself, 
I think like most Europeans, there is something particularly inhumane about the Holocaust itself. So, you know, yes, I'm not like comfortable or happy about the fact that my grandfather was part of a totalitarian regime, direct links with the Holocaust, you know, to me, I don't know whether it's just me, but I'm gonna be honest about my personal feelings on this. To me, that was a different plane. And so when I find this letter, which was in Germany, so I couldn't understand in German, but I couldn't understand, you know, you see your grandfather's name, a swastika at the bottom, Heil Hitler, you know, that kind of that hits. And that's why I also decided to, to make the film um, because I wanted to explore. And throughout the film, um, you know, I bring up at the beginning of the film what this letter is, and then there's the big reveal of what the letter actually said. So why are the Germans writing to my grandfather in 1938, I think? And, you know, that's the big denouement. And, and I think that goes to the heart of, there's a piece, the camera that I do, which is, I think, quite powerful, certainly was delivering it, mm. um, where I say, look, there obviously is a separation. To, to say that fascism was like Nazism is a nonsense because Italian fascism in the beginning had its own dynamic. My argument is the second that you make that pact with the devil and you give your faith and allegiance and whatever to a dictator, then there's no knowing where that train is going to take you. And in the case of Italian fascists, especially the ones that were in the north, then that takes you along with the Nazism, you know, totally implicated in the Holocaust and, you know, the people that were deported. I mean, if my grandfather had been a fascist mayor in a northern Italian town, letters would have come saying, okay, these are the names of the Jews, these are their addresses, get the police to deliver them to the train station tomorrow and ask no more questions. So the division between Nazism and fascism, I think in a way has made the debate in Italy so hard over this because when I met Mr. You know, far right Forza Nuova supporter at Mussolini's grave, the first thing he said was Mussolini was wrong to ally himself with Hitler, but before that he was fine. Um, and obviously I take issue with him on the, but before that it was fine. But it's interesting how he sort of, you know, it's almost like, well, it wasn't as bad as Nazism, so, you know, it wasn't that bad. And I suppose the argument of my film is, well, authoritarian regimes are authoritarian regimes, and once you're on that train, you don't know where it's going to take you. And that, I think, would be the takeaway point that, that, I, that I certainly take away from the film, and I hope that viewers do too. Yeah. Barbara, I've got a bit of a, a counterfactual, if I may, on that, just mm -hmm. you know, from what you found out about your grandfather. Had there not been this division between the North and the South in 43. So had the Germans in, been present in Sardinia, <laughs> say in the way that they were present or involved in Milan, do you think people would have simply followed Nazi fascism the way that the North did? Well, okay, so first of all, I'm not sure that you can say that the North just kind of followed. I mean, there's okay, a lot okay. of stories of, and, and, you know, and resistance all over Europe. You know, that's the question that I can't give you an answer to. I can tell you that there's a guy called Vittorio Tredici, who was the mayor of Cagliari, which is the main town in Sardinia, the sort of capital, uh, that my grandfather was a lifelong friend with, who was actually in Yad Vashem's uh, Garden of the Righteous in Jerusalem, because he did save, not in Sardinia, he was in Rome and managed to save a family of Jews. All I can say is that obviously everyone thinks that their fascist grandfather would have been the person to say, hey, no, you know what, absolutely not. I can't know that. I don't even, you know, I worry about what I would have done. But again, the one thing that I really take with me is that I don't think, you know, it's easy for all of us to think we would do the right thing in that case. But the pressure would be enormous, especially, I've got to say, I don't know whether it's because I'm a new mom, but if you've got kids, you know, there's a lot of things that I would do. And even if it meant not being able to look at myself in the mirror again, to save my children. So to me, the real point is, don't get on that train. Don't get in that situation where you have given power away before and then it gets to a point where, you know, where it kind of, it, you know, either you can't come back or it becomes, you know, when doing the right thing becomes a huge risk and that means that a lot of people don't. Danielle, you just, I guess, to then, you know, your experience is a bit different coming out of Bologna in terms of memory, in terms of, that. I mean, is there something distinctive about Bologna at the time where we talk about resistance that makes it distinct from either the Milan story or the Sardinia story? Or is it just simply something that has to do with fortune that you have a resistance narrative that carries on there as opposed to other parts of Italy? 
Well, uh, one important uh, element to keep in mind, which again uh, is not always uh, well known uh, outside Italy, is that um, the Germans built this fortification line, which is called, called the Gothic line, uh, which runs through basically it's a border between Tuscany and Emilia. And uh, uh, there they stopped the advance of the Allies for, for several months so that a situation was created uh, after 1943 of a country that was uh, split into two with the center and the south occupied by the Allies uh, and the north uh, occupied by the Germans. And that's where uh, Mussolini created his uh, social republic because until Mussolini was deposed and then eventually uh, saved, if you want, by the Germans and put uh, in power in the north of Italy, Obviously, there was a monarchy, but from that moment onwards, Mussolini creates a republic. And what you find in not just Bologna, but in, in northern Italy more generally, above this line is a very vicious war uh, going on between uh, fascists, anti-fascists and partisans and German and fascists. Uh, and that's where really people saw the really ferocious uh, face of Nazism. Uh, because uh, there was a policy for, from the German army to take revenge on the population for any attack by the par partisans. So you have plenty of uh, examples of massacres conducted to try and uh, turn the population there against the partisans. So it, the stories are endless. I mean, there are stories from from all sources and when Barbara says you know it, it's easy for us to say I would never have done that I wouldn't yeah I mean it's it's easier <laughs> from where we are standing so there were pe people uh, on all sides committing atrocities but uh, it's clear that you know the historical responsibility of the German and uh, fascist uh, regimes there uh, it's, it's well demonstrated so uh, what, what happened is, is that you have Italy split into two. For, for us, historical reasons, in some areas, the left had been stronger, so uh, I'd found it easier to mobilize. But as I said, it was also related to where the Germans actually were and where they got stuck for a long time. Uh, going back to, I mean, what we were talking about before, um, I think, I mean, it's important to remember that the term to totalitarianism, so totalitarianism was actually invented by Mussolini. So uh, there is, a, I think, a risk to uh, use the word fascism when what we mean is more generally, much more generally, authoritarian regimes. I mean, there is a reason for this, is what I already mentioned, that in reality it was Mussolini to uh, devise this idea of creating a state that permeates everywhere. So the idea of totalitarianism is precisely the idea of uh, having the possibility to permeate every aspect of life. And that's where the confusion originates, because then you look at regimes which I think are ideologically very different and, and just a shortcut is to say they're all fascists, right? And the other thing that is interesting, you know, what did we, did he want to do with this totalitarianism? And I think this is the essence of fascism is... Uh, creating this new man or woman, although they would certainly focus on the idea of the new man in terms of seeing the man as the one that is really kind of driving history, of course, because of the culture of that period. But the, the important idea is to, to, to create a new Italian uh, so that he's kind of able to kind of project himself or herself into the future. There is a strong idea about modernity. So it, on the one end, fascism look backwards, but uh, it also constantly look forward. So this idea also of violence, which is absolutely the, the core of fascism, the idea of violence in terms of the idea of overcoming obstacles to achieve this great objective is very much at the core of this kind of revolutionary idea of kind of turning Italy upside down. So it's interesting how you have the reaction and the revolution. And this has stayed with fascism throughout its history and it, stay, it stayed with fascists after the war. Because if you look at the history of neo-fascism in Italy, 
which starts immediately because the first uh, uh, fascist party was, although it wasn't called fascist party because it goes against the constitution, you can't create a fascist party in Italy. But the first party that was clearly inspired by fascism uh, was already uh, split into these two factions already. So the kind of hyper conservatives, even monarchists on the one end, and the revolutionaries that were in part inspired by left wing ideas. And this remains in fascism and neo-fascism in Italy today, because you still have these two factions uh, within these movements. And indeed, interviewing some uh, activists many years ago, uh, I was told we have our worst enemies within our own party. Because the idea was, you know, you have the, the, the people who are, yes, totalitarian and um, they, they, they want a, a strong state, everything you like, but in terms of uh, the welfare state in terms of uh, economic measures, they, they look at the left. And then within the same party movement organization, you have people that are conservatives in a kind of uh, really reactionary so look at the society which, uh, uh, you know, once upon a time, everything was good. One, you just have to return to that kind of uh, ideal society. So this, this is quite interesting, in my view at least, because it's a great contradiction of fascist uh, movement and the fascist party also in Italy. Absolutely. Barbara? Yeah, no, I mean, there's one thing, you made me smile a little bit when you said, you know, the word fascism. I cannot tell you the hours that we spent debating with the production team, like over the phrase, Mussolini created fascism in Italy, right? Which then we ended up not using, uh, which I, I, you know, because it, that's just the thing, you know, what is fascism? He may have, I think eventually we settled for the, the term he coined for his brand of totalitarianism, but that's very much, you know, what was it was created? You know, you could argue fascism existed with the ancient Egyptians, but going from the ancient Egyptians to now, Daniel, I'm kind of going to pretend that if I had you on Al Jazeera interviewing you on this, I would ask you the typical journalistic question where I ask you to summarize years of studying into like some 20 second soundbite. But obviously, all eyes are to the US right now. The word fascism is thrown around, bandied left and center right now. I'll tell you the two similarities or echoes or whatever links if I had to make any that I would make. I suppose I would, the, the absolute demonization of the political opposition, I would say that that is an echo. And also what Mussolini had, which were the militias um, in this almost from the start. Now, obviously in the US, it's a slightly different dynamic, but you still have groups that are heavily armed, know how to use their arms, have tenuous links to central government, you know, sort of federal government uh, in, in Washington, DC. And if we look at Trump's very, very strong base, I mean, I've done countless interviews in the past week with Republicans who will say, you know, Republicans can't just go against Trump because we are scared of his base. So you can tell that Trump's control over the millions of people that voted for him is not just a kind of, you know, political party thing. It's it's a direct link that he has via Twitter or whatever to his, um, you know, to his base or members of it. So those are the two similarities that I would find. Daniele, what do you think of that? Would you add any, or do you think it is just absolutely silly and an overstatement and potentially counterproductive to talk about fascism if, for example, we're talking about the US? Well, um, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to answer this on Al Jazeera. Well, not uh, yet, I'm gonna pick <laughs> for an interview. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that uh, um, th there are certainly, I mean, there are certainly parallels between fascism and other authoritarian leaders or regimes. And you mentioned the most obvious one is the demonization of the opposition. Uh, now we, I mean, Trump has started using this term of fake news. Uh, you, you can you can rephrase it. I mean, uh, you can have the rewriting of history. It's a similar concept. It's kind of rewriting things in, in one's own advantage. Uh, so certainly, I mean, uh, there's no doubt that there are some similarities. Uh, I think that the uh, the differences are more important. That, that's what, what I, I tend to say in these cases, in the sense that, I mean, if we, if we want to talk uh, specifically about Trump, I think the best definition for Trump is populist radical right leader. I mean, there is a, a, a strong quantity of nativism in Trump, uh, meaning uh, this idea that everything that is foreign is by definition uh, a threat to the community. That's nativism, that there is even clear xenophobia in Trump. 
Uh, there is a great dose of populism, which means rhetoric about the fact that the people has been betrayed by uh, the elites. Uh, there is authoritarianism. So these are all, I think, ingredients that make people talk about fascism. But the differences are also very many. I mean, uh, does Trump really control the Republican Party? I don't think so. I mean, he's, he's at some point is kind of taking it over for a short while because many within the Cons uh, Republican Party have felt that they had no choice at some point but to get along. Uh, but, you know, he's far from, from having a, a whole party that kind of executes its orders. Uh, second, uh, I was quite presently surprised by the reaction of uh, institutions in America because I don't think American democracy works per, per, um, particularly well in this period. I think this is a cl clear case of a, a weakening democracy and a suffering democracy. Uh, but I was quite surprised by the fact that, you know, uh, for the moment at least, it seems that there has been a clear acceptance in, in, in ma very many quarters of the fact that, you know, an election is an election. So, I mean, and overall, without uh, underplaying, uh, of course, the, the, the risks of, of any uh, democratic organ um, structure turning into uh, a more authoritarian one. And we are, we are seeing examples here in Europe without having to go to the United States. Uh, we are seeing examples within the European Union of this. Uh, but despite that, I mean, uh, we, we should call uh, authoritarian regimes, authoritarian regimes, they might be inspired by various ideologies. I think when we use the term fascism, uh, we use this idea of, uh, yes, it's authoritarian regime, that's for sure. But I mean, I, I would uh, uh, use it when, when movement people, leaders, parties are inspired by this interesting combination between reactionarism and, and uh, revolution. Uh, that's fascism. Uh, and Nazism is inspired by that and is linked to that. Uh, other, other movements, other, other leaders might be radical right or even extreme right. They might have a lot of similarities, but they are not necessarily fascist. And in terms of Trump, I mean, he doesn't want to create a new uh, man or woman or a new American reality. And what he's telling people, you are okay as you are. So there is a, a rhetoric of, you know, the community is okay as it is. People are okay. We just have to just let them be and defend them from these elites, uh, this swamp in Washington that is trying to take away from them what belongs to them. There is no revolutionary project. There is something new to be uh, achieved. So in that sense, ideologically, there are links, but there are also very many differences. Yeah, because he kind of harks back to the past, make America great again. But Scott, I can see there's quite a lot of questions uh, coming up in the Q&A, but I just wanted to just throw a quick one uh, to Daniele, because you use these words, uh, you know, nativist, radical right, far right, uh, fascism, which, I mean, I can tell you working in news, it is so... It, you know, there obviously isn't like a definition. In Al Jazeera, for example, we don't use the word extremist. We don't use the word terrorism, not because we don't talk about these subjects. Of course we do. They cause a lot of victims, especially in the Arab world, but because they're words that mean everything and nothing. I mean, is it frustrating for you to see that the language around it is so confusing and potentially, you know, almost misleading? Yes, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I have to say the truth is uh, that not even academics agree on all these terms. So that, that's the bottom line. So um, nowadays, in the last few years, uh, there's been a kind of uh, wide use of the term far right. Before that, uh, um, a lot of academics like myself uh, used to distinguish between a radical right that remains anyway works within the rules uh, of liberal democracy, although challenges some of these rules and the extreme right. So neo-Nazis, neo-fascists that want to dismantle uh, the liberal democratic system and do not believe uh, in, uh, in the idea that this should be uh, kind of kept and defended, quite the opposite. But the truth is even academics are using very many different definitions. So I just mentioned two. The other one is, is of course, sometimes uh, the, the term populism is used very liberally. 
Um, so it is not surprising. It is not surprising that uh, uh, there is a bit of confusion in the media as well. And what I don't like is that when when people put in the same category, uh, I don't know, the Swiss People's Party with neo Nazis. I, I think that is a wide exaggeration. So <laughs> if we end up because because there are some parties that have clearly radicalized, but if we end up putting we end up with with almost everybody on the right at some point ending up in the same box and they become all neo-fascists then we won't be able to distinguish between um, the aim and objectives of different organizations and the different ideologies yeah and, and i'll just add one final thing because of course you know we talk about international media but overwhelmingly it's english language media which means overwhelmingly it's staffed by brits and americans and i always think you know everyone like le pen or salvini or anyone in europe is far right but you've i've never heard at least the bbc called the brexit party far right now i'm not saying that they are but i'm just saying that obviously you know when people see the grassroots of any one group in their own country then they appreciate the nuances whereas often i just feel especially it's not just all the far right parties but especially the european ones kind of get lumped into one whereas i have never heard i have to say the brexit party on main news be described as a far right party uh, thank you, folks. I mean, in ways, you've sort of touched on some questions that we've already had that we picked up from Medi Ascaria, who talked about the process in Italy, then Germany, and says, would it happen in the United States? Uh, I want to thank uh, Charmian Skelton, who's come in and raised the question, for example, about the rise of modern authoritarian rulers going beyond Trump to talk about Turkey's Erdogan, Indians Modi, uh, Xi in China, uh, Putin in Russia. Uh, I guess if I could just unpack this again, Barbara, from what you found in talking to people, both about the history and about what's happening now, and if it is possible to unpack it, this attraction to the movement, a fascist movement in the 30s, or to the movement now, however we define it, how much of it turns on an attraction to a cult of personality, to the leader, whether it's a Mussolini or a parallel today, how much of it is due to a sense of a new nation, you know, whether you're in Sardinia, whether you're in Milan, or how much of it is due to is due to nativism and that idea of us versus them? Is it possible to separate that out or is it there's just a mix in play here? Uh, again, I mean, I'm just giving you sort of the thoughts as a journalist and someone that has kind of uh, looked into. So again, not an expert view as such. Mm. I would think it's, I mean, it's definitely a cult of personality because you need a strong person nine times out of ten a man and I especially looking at what's going on right now around the world in the west and in non-western countries it's when things aren't going well and countries are facing many problems that I think just some people lose faith in the democratic process because as we're seeing in the US it's really messy and I think a lot of people again would make that pact with the devil where you say well you know what okay it's not democratic that guy's not great he says things that are a bit extreme but he's the strong person that we need to handle the problems that our country's facing right now and one thing that I found really interesting I kept on hearing it again and again I'm a big um, daytime talk radio listener LBC is, is where you will find me before I go to not not exclusively but that's what I listen to and there were so many calls during COVID especially a few months ago when there were different lockdowns in different parts of the world and I remember this one call, call coming from a country in the Middle East uh, a, a very strict country um, and, and this person was saying oh no you know here lockdown is lockdown and if they catch you they'll throw you in jail and if only the UK had something similar then we would be better and it was just in a way chilling but totally predictable how people would think that because you know how many of us in, you know in the sort of interminable COVID months when we've been talking about nothing else have said things like you know look at all these fools out in wherever and the crowds congregating you know there should be a tougher measure and I think that is, I think it's fear, you know, I think fear is a great motivator for these things. And when a lot of things are shaky, it is so tempting to put your faith into the one person who is simplifying everything, you know, spouting off, making everything sound simple, making it sound like they've got the answer and it's fair. And at the end of my, of my film, I say, you know, the three things I identify as, you know, the things that we may be judged on 
in years from now by our grandchildren, how did we react towards intolerance, indifference, but also fear, you know, underestimate the power of fear at your peril and, and, and watch as it unfolds in so many parts of the world. Again, from the Republicans who are too scared to go up against Trump because they know they will be, they'll be getting death threats from his base to a lot of other issues. So that would be, if, if I had to give my, my interpretation, that would be what I think, not just on the past, but also what I see as an Al Jazeera representative. Thank you, Daniele. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this. Uh, I mean, uh, clearly fear was uh, was a very important mechanism, as I mentioned, uh, when fascism step by step emerges as the dominant uh, power uh, in, in Italy. Um, the, the, there is among the middle classes and, and the bourgeoisie a great fear that the, the left would take over. And that justifies for a lot of people uh, supporting Mussolini initially. But I wanted to mention that uh, it's also important to remember that there the, the, was, was another dimension. I mean, fascism really, uh, in many ways, kind of take over with, with a new culture, a new way of life, in which Mussolini was very, very good at selling himself by using the new media. And uh, it's very, very important to see how advanced this is. I mean, he was a journalist himself, so he was very aware of, uh, of the power of the media. Um, there is a very good documentary produced by the University of Warwick that looks at uh, this kind of dimension of, of also Mussolini, the star, if you want. And, and so you can see the postcards with Mussolini that people um, sent to each other. You can see uh, him appearing on ve in various magazines at the time. You can see the documentaries that were shown to Italians before a film was shown in cinemas, which, remember, was the only way for a lot of people to see the moving images, right? The television did not exist. They would see either pictures on the wall of their church, or <laughs> they could see sometimes, if they were lucky, maybe there was uh, something shown in the open uh, in, uh, in the summer in the center of a town, and you can, you, they could see some kind of movie. And before that, before that, there would be 20 minutes of documentary in which they would see Mussolini. So this created a, a cult of personality that was, was about fear, but was not just about fear. It was also about him embodying, for a lot of people, a, uh, the hope of, of a kind of a new rebirth. Uh, and this worked very well. I mean, he, he used to receive an enormous amount of letters from people, so an enormous amount of letters from women who, who were kind of very explicit with him about how much they liked him. He was not just a figure of... Uh, so now we, we, we look at it from the kind of perspective of the 1940s after the racial laws were, were introduced and, and with, with, with the war. But, but before that, I'm afraid that it wasn't just a story of fear. It was also millions of people who, for whatever reason, bought into this new idea, into this new culture, and for many years felt that Mussolini was the right person to... Uh, pull Italy in that direction. Uh, something that, by the way, was also believed by the governments of many democratic countries. Oh. I mean, he had plenty of support in the UK initially. Yeah, no, absolutely. Although I have to say, the same way that our liberal democracies now support dictators around the world when it's in our national interest to do so. You know, I mean, sure. that's what, and we can sit there and think that's terrible, but we're not going to go to war with every country uh, that, uh, you know, that we have human rights issues with. And I can reel off a list of many countries with which the West are allied because, you know, because it's convenient and in our national interest to do so. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, I want to step back into the documentary for just a minute, because you described a very powerful, it, it is a very powerful scene. It's not you describing it, it just is. With this letter that you have discovered uh, from German authorities to your grandfather, uh, which initially you, you're unable to, to understand what it is, and so you have it translated and explained, and it turns out that in 1938 he had been involved in a trade delegation. Mm -hmm. uh, to go to Germany because of Carbonia being very important in terms of coal and what yeah. that might mean. And there's just this moment where you appear to be almost struck speechless as you're trying to work through the fact, well, at least this meant he wasn't involved in the excesses of the Holocaust. 
he wasn't being thanked for that, but still he is involved with the Germans at some level, which is part of something bigger. And I guess what I wanted to ask you about is there's a very interesting question uh, from Viviana Sagrado, which is about humanizing the perpetrators, humanizing those who you're studying. Did you feel going through this that you could humanize your grandfather and others that you were studying, or was there still a wall that was between you and their experience? No, I certainly tried to get, I mean, so the, I certainly tried to not have the wall there because if you keep the wall there, it goes back to my initial assessment of, you know, we're all sitting here in our lovely safe homes thinking, oh, yeah. we would never do that. You know, and I've spent a career at Al Jazeera trying to understand what motivates young Iraqis to join ISIL, which in no way suggests that I, you know, endorse that. But if you don't understand what motivates people, then good luck to you trying to either change the facts or learn the lessons from history. So listen, it was very difficult because because, uh, you know, I mean, this, when I say I weighed every word on this, and I'm always careful in my journalism, but here I weighed every word. And the other thing that made it particularly complicated for me is that it kind of had two audiences. One was the kind of international English speaking, and in Al Jazeera's case, truly international, so not, not just Western, and then an Italian audience. And it had to be like, I knew, and they have, I knew that some people in Sardinia, who knew Sardinian fascism inside out would watch this documentary. I also knew that people who literally had no idea about the history of Italy would watch this documentary. And of course, there's always the temptation of thinking, well, of course, you know, my fascist grandfather, he was the good guy. Now, the kind of the research that goes into the doco is maybe 5% of what I found. And, and by that 5%, I don't include things that I heard from family members, because I think, you know, you hear stories of guards at Auschwitz that, you know, their cleaner says they were great parents. So when I say a lot of the research that was done, I mean, you know, proper research. Now, everything that is bad is in the documentary. I have a full picture insofar as I can of what my grandfather's role was and his beliefs and you know the afterwards uh, as well and and in a way there's a conversation a really honest conversation that I am planning to have with my son who is now four and I'm going to leave it a couple of years before I tackle this with him who is also half Jewish and you know in a way he is the only person that I would be completely 100% honest with. Not because I'm withholding, like nothing that I'm telling you is not true, but the full and total picture, because this is like, it's like holding a landmine in your hand. And whatever you say can be used and twisted to, I, you see fascism, it really wasn't so bad, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I'm not out to demonize my grandfather because I don't think that's the story and I don't think you need to. So I genuinely think, and I know this from a lot of background, that he, A, believed in fascism, comes back from the war. He doesn't even join the Sardinian they had a kind of like national or regional party. He joins fascism straight away in 1919. Um, and, and I know from letters that he believed in, in Mussolini. Um, so he definitely has that. Um, I found no traces of, of any anti-Semitism at the start. Then of course the racial laws are passed and the letter comes and I don't find any evidence either that he stands up against it. But then again, as we say, never got ugly in, in, in that way. Um, I, I get the image of someone that genuinely believed in his land. So he was doing, you know, he genuinely thought fascism was the best way to help Sardinia, which is, it's almost like the Wales of Italy, you know, like they had mining, but in other ways, not, not one of the wealthiest regions. But yeah, I mean, you know, that was very, uh, and there's been very few people that I can have a conversation with um, about this. Um, in a way, I find it very difficult to have it with non-Italians or non-Europeans. Europeans I can have a great conversation with and my god the inbox has been flooding with like all sorts of stories from Finland to Portugal to you know because it, as Daniele rightly said you know it kind of I mean Finland for example I got a letter from someone because the Finns collaborated with the Germans didn't hand over their Jewish population but collaborated with the Germans because they had Russia as a common enemy and so you know someone wrote to me saying he was really conflicted about this because how does he look back at his history and then i just kind of think you know i think our duty is just to to, to truly to truly understand it and going back to viviana's uh question i think i can read it here you find it remarkable when i say i could not be sure of my own reactions i, I don't know viviana you know i say this as as a journalist who's you know at al jazeera you kind of see sometimes the worst of, of people i think it's too easy to think that we would all just stand up and go against the grain and, and because you'd have the fear, especially for your children. And, and that's why it's so key 
to act before. Things happen gradually, you know, know the tipping point. Don't put yourself in a situation where then you have to make massive decisions that could put your family in jeopardy, have you killed and, and all of that. And my grandfather's luck, because he was lucky, was that it didn't get to that with him because he was in a part of Italy, you know. And, and I remember one thing that I remember that an uncle said to me, and again, as I've said, I kept the family side out. But one uncle said, yeah, you know, your grandfather was very sad afterwards for the rest of his life. And I, you know, again, pure speculation. I would guess that if you believe in a project and, and you really think that this is, you know, that you're part of something good that's moving. I mean, he would have known about the violence nearby. We never found any direct links that he was involved in. But obviously, I mean, that's what fascism was. You know, you, you'd hear stories, even if it wasn't happening right there. But... You know, and then the creation of Carbonia would have been his crowning moment. You know, imagine in this area of Sardinia where there's nothing and they build the city. And, you know, like at the film, we speak to someone who was actually a nine year old kid when Carbonia was inaugurated and remembers Mussolini and Piazza. I mean, I'm assuming that for my grandfather, that would have been a great day. But then to find out what, you know, in 43, 45, whenever they found out what the Germans were implicated in and all of that. You know, again, I'll never know, but I can understand why you would feel just sad, betrayed. And maybe that's a lesson in itself to all these people that follow these authoritarian dictators. You know, they, they will betray you because they're lying to you. That's the, that's my lesson. <laughs> oh no, you're off mic. Yeah. <laughs> it sounded yeah. emotional, say it again. <laughs> that's a pretty good lesson, Barbara. There you go, take two, Daniele. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, it's it's uh, interesting again that Carbonia gets mentioned. I think uh, to understand fascism, we really need to go back to Carbonia in the sense that um, here is a, a country in which the great majority of people are actually peasants, in which the industry is just at the beginning, in which the great majority of people can't even write their name. And... Uh, also a country that is in this situation and feels feels betrayed because it's paid a, a very high price uh, in in the first world war and a lot of people think nothing or not not enough is coming back for it and here is a, a, a movement that uh, uh, says uh, um, you know th there is a way forward there is a way to uh, move forward with modernization, move forward with, with finding and gaze to the glory that we used to take for granted, move forward in terms of growing, move forward in terms of industry. This idea of, of you know, the, the future, I think it's, it's very important to understand this. And so, yes, Carbonia, so create a city in a few weeks uh, in the middle of nowhere, but also draining the swamps in Tuscany and creating huge areas that could be cultivated where once upon a time, uh, the real swamps, not the metaphorical ones, uh, were. Uh, so this idea of, of very quickly moving towards a future that in other countries in Europe uh, people could already experience, it's very important to understand the, the kind of uh, feelings of that time. And, and changing the matter, uh, I mean, there is no uh, absolutely doubt that uh, fascism is inherently racist because we can see what has happened uh, with... Um, the events in Africa and what people also used to say about people there. However, uh, for many years, fascism is not specifically against Jewish people. That's a fact. Uh, there were plenty of Jewish people in the fascist party at the highest level. So it is racist in the sense that, the, for instance, if you look at what Italians say as I said, about uh, their, their, their colonial adventure, it's quite clear that they put themselves above uh, many other people. But initially, you know, Mussolini is not against the Jewish people. In fact, he, he was commenting uh, very negatively about Hitler because of that. This is not to say that, you know, the, I mean, of course, the guilt is, is there. And it's a massive event that happened uh, from the end of the 30s onwards. There is absolutely, you know, no, no attempt to, to kind of forget them. Not only people were taken to Auschwitz, there was a concentration camp near Trieste, which is called the Risiera di San Saba, that many Italians don't even know exists, existed. 
Um, and I'm afraid the people were killed there, not in the numbers, and so not comparable with the kind of the scale of a place like Auschwitz. But the scale in itself is not the only point. The point is the idea of that this was itself a concentration camp and, and an extermination camp. So all I'm saying is, you know, uh, you know, people could have joined. In fact, a lot of people have joined fascism and stayed in it for many years without. Uh, having any negative feeling for, for instance, their Jewish neighbors. This well, all also happens much later. Uh, Daniel, I don't, I don't know if you remember, in the film at one point, I have the census, because after the racial laws were passed, the census was called in Italy to, to basically a census of all the Jews. And in Carbonia, because it was a city that was being built, there's only four, and you can tell they're all foreigners from outside because they all have titles. So as you say, residents would have been peasants, whereas these you know, all had titles, engineer. And, and Commendatore Segre, who is the guy that was in charge of building the mine in Carbonia, so Mussolini's great project, was a Jew. So Mussolini himself had put a Jew, because, you know, my grandfather was the mayor, but he was the mayor of the town. It was the mine that was the money-making machine and that had to get the coal and that had to function for the war effort. And Mussolini himself had put a Jew... In, in that position, and presumably, I mean, if the town was ready in 38, he must have done that in what, 36, 37. So already when there's an ongoing alliance. But what I found, um, and the reason again, why the letter was so key, and why I guess I didn't think about making the film before is because I thought I cannot make a film about fascism for an international audience and not link it to the Holocaust. I just can't, even though Sardinia, you know, all the reasons that we've mentioned, blah, blah, blah. And so that's why to me, the letter, was key from a kind of production point of view, because I think to an international audience to mention fascism, even in parts that weren't touched by the Holocaust and you know, the ways that we've discussed, um, would have felt, I just think to an international audience, it would have seemed strange. It would have seemed like I was kind of avoiding issues. Um, but yeah, but it is true. Um, and, and I don't know whether I should have made it clearer in the film, 48 minutes is not actually that long a time when you have a lot of things to put in. Let me, can I follow up on that, which is, is it, we talked a, a lot about, anti, or a bit about anti-Semitism, but could we also pick up on uh, eugenics, which is a feature as it were of, of Nazi Germanism, uh, Germany, and that notion of racial superiority, um, almost, I don't know if it would translate in the 21st century to the notion of white supremacy or Aryan supremacy. Is there an element of eugenics in either the fascist movement generally or specifically in the attitudes that we discover in places like Sardinia? Or is that something which is more of a, 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 a German 1930s narrative? Uh, so again, totally not equipped to answer this. I did not find anything along those lines in, uh, in, in, in my filming, in, in Sardinia specifically then, of course, if we're talking about the Holocaust. Um, nor did I find anything along those lines in the writing about the early, I mean, obviously, as Daniela said, the Italians did terrible things in Libya, for example, but that was more a kind of, like you say, white supremacist, perhaps more comparable to the empire or the slave trade rather than eugenics. I mean, it is quite a, I mean, I know that my family were quite religious as well, so I don't know quite you, how you square eugenics with the Catholic Church, but that's one for Daniela, I think. No, I actually agree with that there was a strong um, idea about uh, trying to create the healthy uh, body and the healthy mind of the Italians. But, uh, you know, you can't talk of eugenics in the way that um, you talk about it in, in Nazi Germany. It's kind of a whole ideology that is built on the idea of kind of pushing out uh, elements that are uh, not pure enough or deteriorating and somehow creating through science and extermination a new reality. I mean, th this is not what happened in Italy. Yeah. Barbara, um, before we sort of come up to the big picture from what you found and so on, I, I just picked up a question here. In fact, a couple questions as we go to finish, but there's one which has come from an anonymous attendee, but I, which just ask about your personal and professional challenges in making the film. And I think it's something I was trying to think about um, in navigating, you know, parallels. If I found something very challenging, which I did when I found out my great grandfather was in the KKK in America, what this must have been a very intense experience. And at the same time, you're a professional, you've got to deliver a, doc a documentary. How do you, how do you do that? Yeah, um, you know, it wasn't, 
listen, I work with people that go and report in Syria and that's a different kind of risk. It, but no, I, I found it very, um, I found it very hard because I was navigating it. I'll tell you, I mean, I was always a journalist first, right? Then a granddaughter. But obviously the, the family angle was there. I also felt I had a duty. You know, again, when I say international media is really English language media, I also felt that, you know, there was a lot of pressure from some other colleagues who are not European um, or, you know, certainly not continental European, you know, extremists at the Lega rally and, you know, everyone here, we can't be fair. And I was very, very str strict on that point. It's like, no, 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 we, we have to be fair because, you know, you don't have to twist things. The events speak for themselves. But look, it was really hard. Um, uh, I don't know how to, I mean, I, I was glad when it was over. I was glad when it aired. Um, I'm also glad that then it aired in Italy because there's two different messages and the message that it sends to Italy. Um, I've received some really wonderful um, messages, but I have to say that whenever I see something pop up in my inbox and I can just tell that it relates to the film by the subject, not that my heart sinks a little, but it's like a little jolt because it takes me uh, back. I, the, the message that I would send is, I don't think that anyone has to say, oh, it's so brave to do this because most of us come from countries with problematic histories. I mean, you know, tell me the country that doesn't have a problematic history, whether it's World War II, whether it's further back, whatever. And we have to be a way of being a little bit academic almost uh, about it, you know, of just looking at the facts and um, dealing with them, trying to learn the lesson and, and try to make sure that when our grandchildren look back on us, they, they, will, they won't understand us. Our grandkids are not gonna understand us. It's just like, it, you know, they, they will never be able to understand our decisions or whatever we, but, but that at least, you know, we, we are okay and lucky enough, you know, to have made the choices that we've made. I mean, I always think by the time my grandfather was my age, he fought in one world war, lived under 20 years of, you know, totalitarianism. Uh, then there was the crash of 29 and then a second world war and then the post-war period, whereas I've had it pretty cushy the past 46 years. Sometimes I always worry, gosh, you know, was it like reverse? He had a tough first half of life and then his second half was easier. You know, maybe it's reverse. But yeah, you know, Scott, it was, um, it was hard, but probably not as hard as people like other people going oh you were so brave I just don't see it that way but I'm a journalist so terrible things happen all the time and you cannot just have history when you talk about the victims that's not what history is that's in a way that's not to me where you learn your lessons you can't we, we only look at the victims and the total monsters it's like well what about everyone in between absolutely Daniele yeah, I wanted to pick up on something that um, Barbara said, because she already mentioned something like this, uh, um, maybe towards the beginning. And I think it's very interesting. It's worth underlining to an international audience. Uh, the parties in, in the other countries are always the fascists, your own uh, right wing. And, and, and an obvious example, I mean, here it's, it's, it's UKIP. Now, you, you look at the rhetoric of UKIP, not at the beginning, not at the beginning, um, but uh, in the last years of Farage's uh, experience as the leader, and even more so after he uh, created a new party, even more so then, the, 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 there are plenty of similarities. In fact, it's very, very similar to that of the League. So either one or the other, either we use the same term for both, because, because I mean, especially because the British media, you know, they, they, they can, a lot of people see the league as, as being the, the most extreme of the extreme, right? But then they, they don't see that uh, very similar things are being said and done uh, in their own backyard. The reality is, I don't think the majority of these parties are not inspired by fascism uh, it's the historical uh, movement. There are some neo-fascist movement and parties in Europe, true, uh, but the majority of the parties we talk about are not inspired by, by this ideology, but they are nativist. They are uh, very often, if not uh, xenophobic, at least anti-immigrant, very often xenophobic. 
and therefore there are some parallels. Uh, but the interesting thing is, <laughs> the, the media tend to see these when when it's some faraway place, but but then tend to ignore them at home because at home parties get normalized, so they part they are part of the kind of uh, political struggles. So in each country, so people just get used to them. Uh, but then somewhere else, oh, they are extreme. <laughs> they, you see the same with Wilders in the Netherlands. Uh, in reality, I mean, a lot of the same is happening across the board. And one thing that is interesting about UKIP is how similar to other European parties it is. It's a very European creation. Yeah, anti-EU. <laughs> That's kind of what... Um, but it's also on Twitter, it's been pretty hilarious the past week. Uh, some people are writing tweets about the U.S. election the way it would be written if it was like an election in some African country that we expect to have a creaky democracy. I obviously can't quote you a single tweet right now because I don't have it open, but it's just been really it's just been really funny to see you know that way it's 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 turned around. But I totally agree with you. I have to say, as a representative of the much maligned media or lamestream media, as it's called, it's not easy times for the media as well. Um, you know, social media has changed the, the, the way things work. Um, uh, there's a money issue everywhere, you know, to report on stories. You can't just rely on the wires that come. You should go and report. Uh, and I think, you know, my particular bugbear is that I'm all for diversity, but diversity also has to include other nationalities. It's not just about ethnicity. And the real problem in that is that language is the non-negotiable when you talk about media, if you're on air or if you're writing, and it's very difficult as a second language English person to, to elevate your language to, to that level. Um, and, and so I think, you know, these are not easy solutions to come by, but yeah, I mean, it's tough times for the media as well. Um, Barbara, uh, you said here, and you also say it powerfully in the documentary that it's not like authoritarianism or fascism just suddenly arrives. People, as it were, have to be conscious or should be conscious that they might be sliding into it or what it is to slide into it. Otherwise it might occur. And earlier there was a reference to a tipping point. Um, I'm conscious that you and Daniele both have young children. So, you know, they've got a world ahead of them they're going into. How close to each of you, how close do you think we are to a tipping point? where this specter of authoritarianism actually becomes a reality in our daily lives. Uh, then I'll give you the journalistic, uneducated answer, and then Daniela will give you a more uh, you know, deep assessment. Okay. Um, I think we're still, don't quote me, but still a way away. I think the level of education, certainly in the West, that people have. I mean, yes, I know that there's a lot of people that treat whatever comes down their Facebook feed like it's the, you know, word of God, but I do think there's a level of education, a level of having traveled, um, you know, and people, I think the thing about fascism is you kind of subsumed your identity to this bigger project, whereas we live in the age of individualism now. So I'm not quite sure how long uh, that would last. So I like to think that we're still a little way away, that we're not at the tipping point, but of course, you know, figuring out when the tipping point is, is half the game, isn't it? Fair enough. Daniele. Um, I don't know whether, um, you know, it's, I, I need to be more scared of things like climate change, of, of the crisis of democracy, the list of things that I'm scared about when I think about also about the new generations is very long. Um, something that I think is very noticeable is that, uh, um, uh, not just uh, uh, more radical parties, but importantly, mainstream parties have now uh, got used to talk about fundamental principles of liberal democracy as if these were kind of optional. And uh, there is no place uh, where you can see this better than the UK. So uh, very openly talking about the fact that judges are a hindrance, that the complicated mechanisms of, of democracy are a problem, uh, the process is too slow, why should the Lords express a view on this? Uh, why should uh, a court express a view on this? Now, I, I find this uh, uh, worrying in the sense that if we, if we believe that there is something uh, to be preserved in liberal democracy, of course, it's far from being a perfect system. 
uh, then I can see how certain language is really spreading and entering the mainstream. I think it's already the mainstream, not just certain media, let's not put them all in the same box, quite correct, uh, but, but very much political leaders. And in the UK, we've seen this in the last few years. I mean, it's really very widespread. So every time that uh, you can see that the uh, checks and balances of a state work, because that's what they are supposed to do. There is somebody now coming up saying, why are you stopping the will of the people from being implemented? Uh, I find this uh, quite worrying as a development. Of course, it's also happening in the United States. Uh, I find it worrying because uh, there should be more education perhaps of why there are checks and balances in place. Mm -hmm. It's precisely because, it's precisely because the will of the majority, which is expressed through elections, needs to be constrained and needs, needs to be limited, right? So uh, democracy is not like the unfettered uh, uh, implementation of everything that uh, 50 plus 1 percent of people happen to agree with. Democracy is something complicated and has procedures. Uh, I find this very worrying, but it's not just um, so this party or that radical party. I think it's very widespread now. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add one thing. I mean, one of the things I found really depressing making this and in the aftermath, actually, just made me realize how little people know their history. I mean, honestly, I've spoken to so many people whose up some knowledge of World War II would come from Schindler's List. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for, I think popular media should highlight some things, but that cannot be all you know, because then, because then you don't have the framework. So that I found quite terrifying, actually. So Barbara, but if I can add something to this, uh, th I think this is one reason why um, people know so little about the empire in the UK, uh, because there is so little in popular culture about it. Uh, I mean, I came here over 20 years ago. I, I don't know how many hundreds of documentaries I've seen on the BBC on the dogs of Adolf Hitler, uh, the friends of Adolf Hitler, the choices of Adolf Hitler. But, uh, you know, it's very rare that you find something that is both popular uh, well produced or possibly entertaining, but also interesting and based on, on actual historical research on a topic like the British Empire, which, which is I mean, of such importance, not just to this country, but to the world. Uh, so yes, I mean, I think there is a, a role to, to be played uh, by, by media, by documentaries. Um, so we don't have to sneer at this, uh, but, but you know, it's, it's interesting how every country then selects the past it wants to talk about. Yeah. Um, so Barbara, before we go back to the world of Donald Trump's Twitter feed and Brexit <laughs> and whatever yeah, is happening. Yeah, the general fun stuff that's in our news bulletins right now, yeah. Yeah, and the other fun stuff. What can you leave us with for either uh, a bit of hope or a bit of caution? Oh gosh. Uh, well, first of all, if I, I just want to, I saw a question from Charmian Skelton about um, education cannot be seen as a shield against authoritarianism because people in Germany were um, educated as well. And believe me, uh, Charmian, I'm not in any way saying that, for example, Trump supporters are uneducated or Soviet supporters. That's not what I meant. I suppose when it, and again, I'm anchoring it to Sardinia. The people that I spoke to that remembered that time do say say that. It's like, look, we 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 didn't have knowledge. We didn't, you know, the people in Sardinia, the, the poor ex-miners, for example, that I spoke to uh, said that they, they didn't know the world and they felt that now that their grandchildren have seen the world, they wouldn't be taken in in quite the same way. So that's kind of what I based um, my comment on. So listen, I just wanted to thank everyone, Scott, you for having the idea, Daniele for all his knowledge, because it's been great talking to someone who, you know, is also very interested in this topic and just and everyone who joined because I'm, I'm really genuinely touched that you would take you know 90 minutes out of your Friday afternoon to listen to this I'll say one thing the movie came out at the end of January and I had this whole amazing promotion tour <laughs> I planned and then you know COVID happened so I didn't promote it the way that um I would have wanted to, of course. So I would be really grateful if, you know, if any of you choose to see the film, which is Fascism in the Family, either on the Al Jazeera website or on YouTube, I'd be very grateful if you could, I don't know, tell your friends or spread the word or put a post. You don't have to, but it's the kind of message that I think is resonating uh, right now. And, um, you know, that's kind of why I did it. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an important topic right now. Not cheery, but, you know, hopefully worth it. So thank you. 
So folks, while we're waiting for Barbara's next documentary, whatever <laughs> that might be, definitely Fascism in the Family on YouTube and Al Jazeera. We'll make sure that the link goes out. And indeed, next week, uh, we'll make sure that the link to this recording it will be available on University of Birmingham social media channels so you can go back through this. So those who couldn't be here today, please tell them about it. Uh, but before we head off, uh, my thanks to all of you who've been there in the audience, those of you who have asked questions. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your specific question, but you have stimulated a lot we've talked about. Uh, my thanks uh, to Daniele Albertazzi, my colleague uh, in Paul's at the University of Birmingham, for bringing his expertise and insight into this. And Thank my you, thanks Scott. Most of all to Barbara for bringing not only her expertise and her insight, but her humanity into this uh, and into everything she does. Uh, it truly has been a pleasure, Barbara, uh, to work with you on this. Uh, and as I said, I hope it's not the last project that we have the chance to Well, I hope that one day soon I can actually come and see you guys in Birmingham and we can do this face to face. But Zoom has been, uh, you know, it's been a good way to know. get around it. Anyway. Well, I would say I'd buy the coffee, except Daniele has better coffee than I do. So yeah, we'll let Italians, him do the we're, not gonna let, we're not going to let an American buy the coffee. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so again, folks, thank you all so much. Stay safe, stay sane, and be decent to one another. Take care. Grazie. Bye. Bye.